Hi, I'm John Mather, Nobel Prize Laureate and Senior Scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope at NASA, and you're listening to The Soul of Life. We can have a sexual identity that evolves and changes and grows, or even discovering that we even have one is, is really big. There's no one right way to have sex. Today on The Soul of Life, I speak with two Brooklyn psychologists, Sina Simon and Simone Humphrey, about their podcast, Love Link founded to help people talk more about sex and love. So much shame surrounding sex. We talk about really common reasons people have problems with sexual intimacy. Penetration and orgasm, like that, that sort of traditional model of what sex is. What happens before sex? What happens during sex? What happens after sex? What's the appetizer? What's the entree? What's the dessert? The power of discovering the difference between arousal and desire a lot of women and heterosexual couples come in and say, you know, I just don't really don't want to have sex. Like, and I think I have really low desire. I don't know, something is wrong with me. The problem is that the standard of arousal is spontaneous desire. That that's what we're right. that's what we're taught in movies. That's what we're taught in just our kind of day to day interactions. That we should just be turned on automatically. And for men too, who experience more responsive desire, they also have a lot of shame. Well, I should just be horny all the time. I should want to have sex whenever. And we talk about how millennials are having sex. The DSM talks about deviant sexual behaviors. Anything kind of related to BDSM, it's a really difficult taboo for a lot of therapists to shift out of. If you're engaging in some kind of harm, there must be something wrong with that. And does marriage matter anymore? Successful open relationships often require more communication than I think monogamy, which when it works, it really works. Welcome to episode 19 of season two of The Soul of Life. I'm Keith Miller, and this is Letting Go of the Right Way to Have Sex. I'm Keith Miller, and my podcast, The Soul of Life, is here to help you remember who you really are. I'll bring together people who have gotten off their treadmills. I'll have conversations with athletes, musicians, doctors, scientists, healers, and entrepreneurs to discuss the fascinating edges of our knowledge in neurobiology, psychology, and physics. This is The Soul of Life. Have you ever been in a position where you know that you or your family member really needs emotional support or marriage enrichment, but you find out how expensive it is to get access to high quality out of network professionals? Well, I've created the Soul of Life community just for this. At community.souloflifeshow.com, you can join for free and be part of a network of caring and supportive people having conversations that can bring healing to your soul. It's there that you'll find access to psychoeducational courses to deal with stress, anxiety, and relationship conflict. For example, right now I'm offering a seven-week immersive course for couples called Mindful Marriage that walks people through a mindfulness-based stress reduction curriculum I designed that really gives couples in conflict a map towards stability, trust, and deeper intimacy. Just go to community.souloflifeshow.com, check out the courses, and join for free to be part of the Soul of Life community of learners and soul seekers. Love Link is a podcast produced by two Brooklyn psychotherapists, Sina Simon and Simone Humphrey, who interview psychologists, astrologers, researchers, and others to find out the hidden wisdom around all things love and sex. And I'm here today with Sina and Simone. Hey, how are you? Hi, Hi. Keith. So Thanks nice to for be having here. us. Yeah, uh, great to finally catch up with you. I know you've been very busy with your podcast and in, in New York. How are things in, in New York? I heard things are just starting to open. I heard like July is going to be like big. <laughs> yeah, the, the word on the street is that it's going to be the roaring 1920s. I keep on hearing <laughs> that. <laughs> Wow. But but yeah, New York is is starting to really blossom. Literally, people are out more. Um there, you know, there's there's fewer people wearing masks outdoors, which is I think a, a real shift that happened recently this week. Um yeah, so it feels like it's it's kind of starting to emerge into post-pandemic life, perhaps. Right. 
That's it's it's nice to see things coming out of the ground. Um, we have these cicadas. The, they're seventeen year cicadas that are coming up out of the ground in by the billions, one acre. Every seventeen years, they come out of the ground here, and it's really in Maryland. It's it's this fascinating thing, even in the city in D.C. And so, for the next month or so, we are going to be invaded by these, you know, pretty big size bugs. It's great for cats and dogs because they just eat them, and, and birds just eat them but it's this fascinating thing to see life coming back and coming out even things that are like underground for like 17 years it's fascinating so although it sort of has apocalyptic vibes too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah it does if you don't like bugs it's not a good it's not a great time here i remember um, them from growing up in dc yes. and they're so loud they are so yeah. loud. Yeah. So you either really love it or really hate it. I, I tend to think of them, these ancient creatures. It's like we, we're getting in touch with this ancient, our ancient, you know, insect selves. Yeah. <laughs> Not everybody likes that association. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me about Love Link. I'm excited to hear and, and really um, love your podcast and love to hear mm-hmm. how you started this and, and why you're doing it. So... Yeah, Simone and I met when we were working at the VA together as trainees, and we found that we worked really well together. We were running a group for Vietnam veterans. And then when we ended at the VA, we had a brunch like a few months later, and I was going through a divorce, and Simone was recently married. And we didn't find that there was a lot of good information online about sex and relationships and navigating some of this difficult territory in relationships. And so we decided that we wanted to start an online platform for people uh, where we would interview researchers and clinicians in the field around issues of sexuality and relationships and where people could really get some good information that was more in-depth rather than, you know, um, top 10 ways to navigate a breakup, you know, but that's where there was really some meat and um, yeah. So that's how it started. And then we've expanded it out to be a, a platform where we're more exploring the relationship to self and other. It's no longer only sexuality and relationships. Right. Right. There's such an audience for it. Right. And I imagine you, you hear from people about how, how much this topic needs to be talked about. We, we seem to be a sex positive culture. If you look at media, it seems like there's sensuality and, and that, and, and eroticism in, in a lot of themes in our media, but we're really not that open about sex, are we? No, no. absolutely not. And, and Sina and I were so interested in romantic relationships. And I think in our training and in the fields, there, there's not a lot of exposure that people get. And so this was sort of both our way to promote, but also our way to educate ourselves and, and expose ourselves to the language, to talking about sex, to kind of pushing through that taboo of discomfort. Right. And I think professionally, and maybe you're experiencing this too, Keith, that you know, when, we're, when we're psychologists, you're oftentimes in a very uh, limited context. You're seeing patients, you're doing psychotherapy. And so it's so nice professionally to be able to expand um, like the arenas that we work in. And it's been so amazing to work with a partner too, that we can be creative in, that we can be playful in. Um, so it's been a real kind of both labor of love, but also sort of experimentation on, okay, what, what can we do in the field that feels like it's pushing boundaries, it's doing something different. Um, so the right. podcast has been one thing, workshops, we, yeah, we're just having, having um, things that were, were I, I take photographs. And so there was a, a, a project that we did where we took photographs of couples on the street and asked them about kind of what they learned about being in relationships. And so it's been, it's been fun. Right. That's great. I mean, I, I love that you have this focus on couples. Uh, that's been a big part of my my work as a social worker and, and trained in attachment based and uh, attachment based psychotherapies. Um, yeah, it's 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 such a need, right? I mean, going back, I may date myself, but was it? I think MTV Doctor Drew was it Love Line? I guess mm-hmm. um, I'm not sure mm-hmm. if that's something that rings a bell for you, but um, you know that was super super popular. And you know, podcasts that talk about sex are they tend to be really popular. I mean, there's there's that there's that sex appeal sort of thing but you guys go deeper than that just talking about sex it's, it's not just about um uh, and it is probably about you do talk about all sorts of things um and and are very open about 
kink and poly and um, BDSM. And we'll, we'll touch on some of these topics because um, I think it's interesting for people to hear what's out there and, and to know they're not alone in this topic. That's one of the things I find in my clinical work is everybody feels like they're doing it wrong or somebody else is doing it better when it yeah. comes to sex. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So much shame surrounding right. sex. Right. Yeah. 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 And so, people are not practiced talking about sex. So, you know, most like Simone said, we're not educated about uh, talking about sex in graduate school. They're, unless you seek it out as a clinician, right. you're not really going to get exposure to it. Right. But right. I think a lot of clients come in and, and think it's inappropriate to bring up in the session. Mm-hmm. And a lot of therapists come in and think it's violating or intrusive to ask about it. And right. so oftentimes, yeah, both people collude with this avoidance. Exactly. It can make us uncomfortable as therapists. And then, and so we have to Mm. examine that, right? Exactly. Exactly. What are some of the things that you've, you've been working on lately in your podcast? What what are some of the guests that stand out for you? The exciting thing about the podcast is that the evolution of the content that we put on there kind of is going with our own evolution. So, you know, our interests in psychedelics emerged the last year. Sina and I went to the psychedelic training that we were really excited about. Um, And so we wanted to integrate that more into our work. And I think now Sina had a baby recently. I'm pregnant. Congrats. Thank you. Starting to to also bring in more parenting um, and and romantic life within the parenting context, but also just what it's like to be a parent. So I think it's, it's been really exciting to see See how how we can evolve. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. So broadening from from really just focusing on sex to all of life, right? Absolutely. Um, and something we've been doing more recently too is is expanding into corporate culture. Mm-hmm. You know, I love the, the podcast is great because it's just for the public and it just hits anyone that wants to listen and it's free. Um, but we're also really excited about yeah, I think making impact rather than on a one to one level on a broader scale. And so going into companies and teaching relational skills has also been really exciting, especially because we know so much of corporate culture is anti-relational. And especially corporate culture has so much power in our society that it's been kind of exciting to think about, okay, how can we how can we increase people's emotional intelligence, connectivity, um, inclusiveness in areas that do not often thrive in this right. in this field. Yeah, yeah. We need we need some bright lights. We need we need some <laughs> uh, islands of joy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's actually been really amazing. We've done a couple of corporate workshops, and people love the material we present around you know attachments around relationships because they don't get this information in life. Right. They don't, there's no other, you know, they didn't go to graduate school for mental health. If you're not right. in, in therapy or not necessarily seeking it out online, you're not getting this information. And they just seem really excited about it, uh, even in the corporate context. Yeah. I, I wish we could have that in primary education, right? Sort of relationship oh skills 101. That'd be amazing. And yeah. If we could all agree on like, like this is important and these are some basics and, you know, this is not going to harm anybody by <laughs> talking about sex when we're young. And um, Colleges yeah. are doing that more. Like Alexandra Solomon teaches yes. um, Marriage 101 at Northwestern. Right. I know at Rutgers, um, Dr. Karen Rigskeen, who is someone that I worked with at Rutgers. Yeah, they're, they're starting to, to introduce this more into college curriculums and they're booked. I mean, every yeah. single time they offer it, it's like filled with the wait list. So I yeah. think that speaks to the, the real demand. That tells mm-hmm. you where we should be creating our workshops, yes. I guess. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, speaking of sex, since that's what I'm interested in talking about <laughs> in, in, in part here, <laughs> knowing that knowing that you have that background and 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 comfort with talking about sex, what what are some of the themes that you've run into in your teaching? Um, what comes up in your clinical rooms and, you know, what, what do you find yourself saying to people in teaching? What themes, if there's any, that come up around sex and intimacy? I think the broadest theme, I mean, Sina and I were discussing this earlier, that we have to kind of constantly repeat to our clients and our workshops is the idea that there's no one right way to have sex. You know, I think so most people come in with certain assumptions, oftentimes very 
conventional, traditional, um, one model of how to have sex. And when you don't meet that expectation, there's a lot of shame or inadequacy or feeling like you're doing something, um, yeah, doing something wrong. And so I think just like putting it out there that there isn't one right way and, and to really encourage curiosity about how they're thinking about sex and how they would like to be thinking about sex um, has just been a kind of huge shift, I think, mm-hmm. for people. And, right. and to really explore this idea of um, cultivating a sexual identity. You know, so often people come in and they think therapy is about kind of discovering themselves emotionally and relationally. And all of that is really important, but that, that tends to be the focus. And this idea that we could have a sexual identity that evolves and changes and grows, or even discovering that we even have one is, is really big. Right. How about for you, Sina? Yeah. So, I'll, I mean, the same, the same as, as Simone, a lot of it is just educating people that there's no right way. And as part of that, it's uh, also about challenging the traditional norms around penetration and or- orgasm, like that, that sort of traditional model of what sex is. So in getting more creative and talking more openly about sexuality, it's like, let's focus on the whole sexual spectrum. You know, what's psychological, like Simone was saying, what's foreplay, what's What's aftercare? What happens before sex? What happens during sex? What happens after sex? Susanna Izenza has this sex menu that she talks about. Uh, You know, what's the appetizer? What's the entree? What's the dessert? Like really getting people creative in their thinking around around sex and and not having to pigeonhole themselves into one particular idea. Um, You know, I think just developing a sexual language People aren't used to talking about sex. Uh, so in therapy, it can be an opportunity to speak openly, to, yeah, develop the, the language, get, get the words. What is the actual experience they're, they're having? Emily Nagoski's idea of uh, responsive versus spontaneous desire. Yeah, talk um, about that for a minute if you can. Yeah, that, that some people are wired to um, experience desire arousal in response to something so in response to a stimulus mm-hmm. um and some people so they, like they won't get turned they won't really be interested until maybe their partner is touching them or until right. they begin touching their partner or they watch something right. they watch porn or right. even just like go out for a romantic dinner and that's yeah. the thing whatever it is yeah or they're touched in a particular way or some music you know whatever the stimulus is and whereas other people experience more spontaneous desire so desire that it's not necessarily in response to right. anything. You're you're doing the dishes and you feel horny. <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that idea, I think, has been for, in, in my experience, has been particularly helpful for women. Um, and I'm totally generalizing all generalizations being sure. false because there are a lot of women who also experience spontaneous desire and a lot of men who experience responsive. But a lot of women in heterosexual couples come in and say, you know, I just don't really don't want to have sex. Like, and I think I have really low desire. I don't know what, something is wrong with me. And their partner, their male partner would be like, yeah, something is wrong with her. She doesn't ever want to have sex. And then this idea of, well, wait a minute, maybe it's more that you are, have a responsive uh, model, you know, that your desire is more responsive. And then that opens something up for couples and then they can get creative and actually a lot of the times find that, wait, there isn't a problem with desire. It's just operating differently. The problem is that the standard of arousal is spontaneous desire, that that's what we're, right. that's what we're taught in movies. That's what we're mm-hmm. taught in just our kind of day-to-day interactions that we should just be turned on automatically. It always happens and it always finishes. Exactly. And so I think, and, and I think particularly for women, right, they think there's something wrong with them. And for men too, who experience more responsive desire, they also have a lot of shame. Well, I should yes. just be horny all the time. I should want to yeah. have sex whenever. And then the, oftentimes, it's the female partners that feel like, well, what's wrong with you? Why, why aren't you just turned on by me naturally? Mm-hmm. And right. so I think this model is so relieving um, to so many people of, okay, there's not something wrong with me. This is just how my body is wired. And, and, then, and then the couple can start thinking about, or even just the individual, yeah, what, what does turn me on? Um, right. what, yeah, what does kind of trigger 
desire for me. And sometimes that might mean that arousal doesn't happen or desire doesn't happen until arousal happens. You know, many people have a framework like in order for me to have desire, I have to be turned on. Um, But oftentimes it can be the opposite way. Right. You might not have desire until you're turned on. Exactly. (laughs) And there may not be, and there's no shame in that. It's just what's happening. So what you're saying sort of gives this big relief of this shame burden. Yes. That mm-hmm. something's wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, yeah, I, you probably hear this all the time, but I'm constantly telling my clients that sex is your, your biggest, your biggest sex organ is your brain, right? mm-hmm. your, your entire body, but your brain especially. And anxiety, the stories we're telling ourselves, the thoughts that that distract us, and those don't go away by fighting them. <laughs> no, um, no. You know, we get more anxious when we have a have a frustrated response to ourself. Yeah. And that's the biggest libido killer. If you're in anxiety, yeah. forget it. You're not relaxed. You're not in your body. Right. You're right. Definitely right. not going to want to have sex. Right. One, one of the favorite things I heard one of my teachers talk about um, is that, you know, th- I think she was talking about her pet peeve of saying when people say they're horny, like, or w- when they're in the mood, like, why not just reframe this and talk about w- when I'm relaxed, because when you're relaxed, when you, when you know how to relax yourself and when you know how to engage with anxiety and, and get to a place of self, self soothing or self regulation, well, it doesn't mean that you're going to spontaneously be aroused, but you at least have a pretty fair shot. <laughs> Yeah, I like that. Yeah. So, so it's similar to the idea of willingness. And I think there's there's a real preconception that I have to be really horny. I have to be so turned on in order to have sex. And that can often lead to kind of really long dry spells between partners rather right. than, yeah, maybe I'm not really aroused right now, but I'm, I'm relaxed, I'm willing, I'm open. And then once we get started... Right. then I can get revved up. Um, and right. then I really enjoy sex and I'm really glad that we did it. So this idea of willingness, I think is really important. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I've always thought of sex disorders, sexual disorders or arousal disorders being one of the most treatable things in our field because the brain the brain wants, I mean, you get this huge reward when it works. <laughs> and even just a little bit of a reward helps with creating habits. Like you're saying like, okay, I... If I can, if it's a little bit of exposure therapy, sort of, well, we're going to make a date and we're going to try to get together and have some physical contact because it's on the calendar. Well, the brain, like you said, the body responds next time it's on the calendar. People bristle at that at first. You're, you're more into it. Your body's already engaged. It's doing its thing because it wants to learn to have fun. Um, That's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah. Highly, highly treatable. And, and right, the idea of like having everything be spontaneous and suddenly erupting, like life gets really busy and having something on the calendar and carving that time aside is often really necessary to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially, especially with when kids. You, that's a, I was just say, <laughs> <laughs> as I'm learning. <laughs> what time? What time? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. Being able to say... Yeah, to to coach parents around saying like they they can say no to their kids. They can like like they can they can kids can sleep in their own beds, for example. Like that can be I means such a wonderful you know parental experience to have your kids be that accessible to you. But also watch out, right? Because that's your space and that's your intimate space. And that I, I know from talking to so many people that 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 doesn't come back unless you keep it, unless you hold it and create right. that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, t- can we talk about being sex positive for a little bit? Because that's been something some people who are more conservative might kind of wonder, like, what does that mean? Does that mean like everything about sex is always appropriate? Like anything goes like, and that's really not what it is. So I wanted to ask you to describe what sex positive is, because that's been a big movement, I, I think, in our in our field. Please take the time now to subscribe to The Soul of Life wherever you're listening give it a thumbs up or write a positive review. That's the best way to make sure you don't miss out on these amazing episodes planned for season two. 
I think to kind of go back to what we were talking about in terms of sex education, sex positive to me really means that there's no one right way to have sex. While it may not be saying that anything sexual is positive, um, it's saying that everyone has different ways of doing it. Um, and feeling positive about these different forms um, and understanding them and what it what it what it provides for for patients um, and also helping people to become comfortable with their sexual identity with their sexuality and also um, be open to the sexual behaviors of others um, especially when it involves consent um, and and comfort and yeah part of it is also as therapists being sex positive means being educated. So it's a, a lot of, again, we talked about this earlier, like a lot of therapists, unless you seek it out, seek the education out, you're not necessarily going to get the information that you need in order to be sex positive or feel comfortable talking about sex. So, you know, uh, being exposed to different types of sexuality, talking about sex. I mean, all of this takes practice and getting comfortable. And that's, that's and, and taking a curious rather than a judgmental stance. Um, we were interviewing Ian Kerner and, and he talked about that in the, I think it's the ASECT training. Um, they, as, as part of the training, therapists are exposed to different types of porn. Um, and then they sit and talk about it. They talk about the, all the feelings that come up for them personally. That's the, um, the SAR, Sexual Assessment Reorientation. Is I, that, believe I don't know what I it's called. that's what but it's called. Yeah. S-A-R. Yeah. yeah. And that seems really, really important work to do for all therapists, right? To be able to just to understand, you know, what are the blocks to talking about sexuality for me personally? you know, uh, practicing, g- getting more open and, and, and hearing about different types of sex and seeing different types of sexuality. So Ian Kerner's wildly popular book was She Comes First, right? That was the, that was his big, maybe he's had other ones too. Yeah. yeah. Well, he has a new one coming out called, so tell me th- about the last time you had sex. Mm-hmm. Oh. Mm-hmm. The opening question that he asks every couple in sex therapy. Ah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> But I was going to mention Keith because you had you had sort of spoken about um, older therapists who sometimes have a have a harder time with this idea around sex positivity, and it, you know it wasn't that long ago that the DSM talked about deviant sexual behaviors and right. and and a lot of that including I mean not just being gay as sexual deviants but also um, anything kind of related to BDSM and, and pain. And so I think it's a really difficult taboo for a lot of therapists to shift out of, which is, oh, if you're engaging in some kind of harm, I'm going to putting that in quotes, that there must be something wrong with that. And I think as therapists, it is kind of murky waters because on the one hand, people could be engaging in harmful sexual acts that are problematic. Um, and on the other, there's a lot of people that engage in BDSM and kink that where they where they really enjoy pain in this way, that it feels right. safe and there's a lot of pleasure that comes from it. And I think as therapists, we have to be really cautious and really um, curious about what it means, what it what it provides for them, um, the roles it serves, how it's happening, getting getting kind of more detailed answers before coming to any kind of assessment. Right. Because I've heard so many couples who go to a therapist who who actually that they're not even going to talk about their sex life as a problem. And then when they discuss certain behaviors or certain things that they engage in and they feel that judgment or they feel like their therapist is making it a problem for them, they, they lose them. Right. And there's the, the old cliche of like the 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 therapist, maybe maybe it's the analytical therapist, the old school analyst who's um all of a sudden gets really interested in this young female sex life, like, right, like this sort of inappropriateness of that, but also the, the level of the, 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 the onus being kind of on the client instead of the other way around. Mm-hmm. The, the onus mm-hmm. be, should be on the therapist to engage and try to understand the story and the context mm-hmm. and the meaning. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And connect with their client. Now, and, and it, and it doesn't, um, disregard the fact that there there can be out of control sexual behaviors like that Absolutely. that is still a part of our practice to be right. helping people assess is this part of your life in balance with other parts of your life 
even if we're talking about drinking, for example, right. what is excessive drinking? Uh, so it can be hard to pin down, right? We can use the objective sort of by the book, or you can talk about how it works in your life and get to understand the context of how that person's system works. Right, right. Um, so I think having that attitude of sex positivity is really coming into it without coming in with judgment, really being right. open, really s- right. celebrating some of the things that feel really healthy, um, even mm-hmm. if they are unconventional. Right. And I think we have to remember that as therapists, we actually hold a lot of power. Right? People see us as experts. And so if we, you know, if we're judgmental of something or if we, uh, you know, uh, frame something as a problem, people, you know, people take that seriously. People don't really put up with a therapist that's not willing to do some self-disclosure and kind of say like, I'm in this with you. And I can imagine like a, a couple coming in saying like, you know, we, we want to know if we can trust you with yeah. what we're about mm-hmm. to disclose. Absolutely. I think, I think especially for younger people, you know, Sina and I both work with a lot of 20s and 30 year olds. And um, I will see people that have come from another therapist where they felt really uncomfortable because that therapist was so, um, such a blank slate was coming from a more traditional analytic model. And so I think they really want to know, are you a human? Um, Can you respond to me? Do you have emotions? Um, Can I ask you a question and you not be so equivocating and and kind of mysterious? Is it a fair question or is it a weird question to say, how are millennials having sex? It's a fair question. And, and it's a tricky one because I don't know if there's any concrete answers or, or um, one answer. But, you know, there's all of this research coming out that millennials and Generation Zers are having less sex, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, I think it's important for us to question, challenge some of the, the research where they're getting this data from, how, how the methods in which they've collected the data. Um, but, you know, there, there may be a point to that. That, that millennials are both having less sex, but talking more about sex, which is sort of a weird um, contradiction. Mm. And, and I think something that I've really noticed is that a lot of younger people are very anxious. Um, they're having maybe harder times connecting to others. There's maybe more social isolation. Mm-hmm. So it can be harder to have opportunities to have sex. Is there a generation of people losing faith or have lost faith in marriage? I think there's some truth to that beyond just the fact that, uh, you know, it's, it's harder to get married. People, people don't have as much money to get married. They don't have as many savings as they, as they used to. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I hear a lot of people talking about how divorce is so normal that why, why bother getting married when, when it's so, it's probably inevitable that I'll get divorced, you know, this type of, this type of language. Um, I don't think people really, yeah, see the need to get married in the same way that they used to. There's not as much of a social pressure. I mean, there still is to a certain extent, but but less so. I think also it's interesting, you know, I'm originally from Denmark and in Denmark, there's, there's no advantage really to getting married. You don't get a tax benefit. Um, you know, there's no like need for health insurance from your partner. Uh, and and people don't get get married as often. Mm. Marriage is mm. really severely on the decline. The anxiety of having one partner for the rest of your life like mm-hmm. seems scary. Right. I think a, a more optimistic view is is also that people are thinking about relationships differently. That they're not necessarily thinking about one person for the rest of my life, and more. Um, around satisfying relationships and finding someone that's a really good fit. And if and when we grow out of this or if and when we evolve, that maybe we break up and that's not a failure, but we're looking for something different. Mm -hmm. Because I think people are putting... I also, I mean, on the flip side too, there's a lot of high expectations around relationships, I think more so than in the past. Um, This idea that a, a partner really meets all of our needs um, versus just one need that might be more familial or, or domestic. Right. And so when you put that much pressure on a person, um, it can be harder to, to sustain forever. When you, when you feel dissatisfied, right. um, you're more likely to end and, and find a partner that, that feels better. Yeah. The more fractured we are in our social lives, the more 
pressure gets put on that one relationship and it's it's maybe yeah. arguably never meant to have that amount of pressure but absolutely um, mm-hmm. it, 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 as we wrap up here it, it it leads naturally to the idea of open marriage and uh non-monogamous relationships um I have come across people, met people who are very enthusiastic about that and very, you know, they're believers, they're, they're, uh, converts. Maybe they've gone down the other road and they've tried it and they've, they're out <laughs> for that reason. They're out. Um, so what, what's your sense about that? I mean, I, I don't have personal experience with it. I, and I, I would say I have a fair amount of skepticism, um, myself about it being any better. Like it's like the grass is greener. One, you know, it's one or the other. Each each has its own challenges. I don't know if what your experience is with. I think again, it comes down to there's no right way. Like for some people, this really works much better. And and once the stigma and shame is taken away, then that actually feels it feels really good to pursue yeah. an open marriage, open relationship, and right. people thrive. And some people, like you said, like I, I have a couple now where the male partner has tried an open relationship before and it did not work for him. He got really scared. He got really anxious. It didn't feel safe. Um, and so for some people, I think it's, it, it doesn't, that's not where they thrive. That's not where they feel expanded. They, they feel expanded and, and more in their just having a monogamous relationship and other people feel expanded with multiple people. But this idea of there's no right way, I think that that's really, um, that seems to be more of the shift in, in amongst millennials. And I think, I think a lot of open relationships don't work because people go into it with the expectation of, Oh, we'll just open it up and we can have more partners and that'll be great. And, and don't realize that actually successful open relationships often require more communication than I think monogamy. You have to really, which which when it works, it really works because partners are able to talk about their feelings, challenge assumptions, really design their own relationship in a really beautiful mm-hmm. way. And I have seen it work really well. Um, but it does, it does require more effort and time and investment. And um and you're, you know, in a tight and busy schedule, a lot of juggling around multiple right. people. I hope people check out your podcast. It's called Love Link and tell people where to find you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, lovelink.co or lovelink. We're on Instagram and we have the podcast. We also recently started a platform called Modern Mind, modernmind.co, uh, which is for our corporate workshops that we're doing. Uh, Sina Simon and Simone Humphrey, thank you for joining me here. Thank you so much for having us. It's been a real pleasure. Hey, I've started a community for Soul of Life fans interested in talking about episodes or getting more information about some of my teaching on IFS, mindfulness, and relationship growth. Head on over to community.souloflifeshow to get access to this group of really cool people just like you who care about the show and want to talk about episodes or or hear more, get access to courses and, and support each other through life. That's what this is all about. Please leave an iTunes rating for the show and subscribe now wherever you listen to get more soul in your life. I like it and it's not harsh to my eardrum. All right, I will go. 